Holy mackerel. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Holy Mackerel Moments with Harry Hart Brown, episode number 11. 11 supposed to be a very spiritual number. They even write books about it. Songs are sung. EO 11. EO 11. Today we're going to Hollywood. Hooray for Hollywood. Hooray for Hollywood. I have a couple of short, very sweet Hollywood Holy Mackerel moments, followed by the big kahuna, if ever a whiz of a whiz there was. But first, Holy Mackerel moments are those wondrous moments in life, everyday life, where amazing things happen, little moments of synchronicity, moments of wonderment, surprises that make us want to say, Holy... Oh, no, not again. Holy... Holy cow. Holy cow! Holy cow! Holy crumbs! Holy smoke! Oh, wait, it's coming. It's coming! I expect to catch a macro, mama. I catch my macro. <laughs> <laughs> yes! Holy macro! Holy macro! I want to thank my subscribers. I have new subscribers, my young friends. Thank you so much. You know who you are. And I thank anyone who's donating. There's a link below if you want to donate to help support the channel. And 10% of that money goes to the Nature of Wild Works in Coors Gold, California. Wonderful wildlife care center that gives loving lifetime care to a huge variety of non-releasable wildlife. So... Thank you for all that. I'll put a link to Wildworks down below. On to Hollywood. Years ago, my dear friend Jackie Hyde introduced me to her friend Piper Laurie, a very gifted actress known for The Hustler, for Days of Wine and Roses, for Carrie, for Twin Peaks, and many other roles. Um, Piper told me that when she was young, she had an acting idol who was Claire Trevor. She would go to the movies and watch Claire Trevor and say, I want to be as good as she is. Claire Trevor won an Oscar for Key Largo. She starred in Stagecoach with John Wayne and was known as Queen of Film Noir. Well, fast forward many years, Piper Laurie found herself in Hollywood making movies. She was getting parts and her career was off to a good start. And one night, some friends invited her to a Hollywood party. Hollywood party, get up, get up, get in it. Hollywood party, oh, nobody sleeps tonight. She went, it was a cocktail party, and she was standing talking to her friends and she looked across the room. There was Claire Trevor. She froze. Her friend said, go introduce yourself. She said, are you kidding? No, I'm much too nervous. I can't. Later that night, Piper was talking to someone. She felt a tap on her shoulder. She looked, it was Claire Trevor, who said, pardon me, aren't you Piper Laurie? Piper said, yes. She said, my name is Claire Trevor, and I just have to tell you, I think you're one of the most talented young actresses working in films today. Can you imagine your idol honoring your work? That's a sweet moment, holy mackerel. And it kind of reminds me of a similar thing that happened to me, although not so grand, and I mucked it up a bit. I had many acting idols as a kid, and one of them was Nita Talbot. She did tons of television work in the 60s, and I'd be glued to the tube watching her. Whenever I saw her name in TV Guide, I'd go, Nita Talbot, she's so good. I can't wait to see her. And she was always really good. Well, fast forward years later, I'm in a play in Los Angeles. And after the performance one night, I go to a restaurant, and a friend greets me at the door and says, Harry, there's a woman who saw you in the play tonight. She loved what you did. She'd like to meet you. I said, okay. He'd led me to meet Nita Talbot. She's right there in person looking at me. I almost fainted. And my friend said, Harry Hart Brown, Nita Talbot. I said, you don't have to tell me. Here's the problem. I was so overwhelmed by seeing her in person, I didn't hear what she said. She spoke during that introduction. She said I was brilliant because she'd seen me in the play earlier. 
but it didn't register. I didn't hear her. So here's how the conversation actually went. He said, Harry Hart Brown needed Talbot. She said, you were brilliant. I said, you don't have to tell me. Uh, uh. On to Oz. Remember the Wizard of Oz? Writer L. Frank Baum had many books published in the early 1900s, including The Wizard of Oz. He died in 1919. Years later, in 1939, Hollywood said, let's make a movie based on The Wizard of Oz by L. Frank Baum. So, oh, oh I'm sorry. Did you hear Puffin? He was saying hello. Puffin sends his regards. Hey. Okay. Do you want to come up? Do you want to do a cameo in the video? Hold on. Here, yeah, baby. Yeah. You want to come up? Hey, meow. Hey, my boy. Hey, my boy. Say hi. You got fans. Yes, they love you. I do. Meow, meow, meow. He says, let me out of here. Oh, God. Ah, I love him so much. Where was I? Oh, um, there was <laughs> Wizard of Oz. Yeah, so anyway, um, Victor Fleming, the director, said, for the costumes, I want them authentic. The ones in Kansas before the twister hits. I want real farm clothes and so on and so on. And for the uh, role of Professor Marvel, the man she meets in the woods after she sings over the... There he is. After she sings over the rainbow and runs away from home, she sees this guy in a trailer in the woods roasting a hot dog. Well, 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 house guests, huh? <laughs> oh, Toto, that's not polite. We haven't been asked yet. And he's kind of like a snake oil salesman, and he gives her a bogus uh, uh, crystal ball reading and so on. And then she runs away, and then the twister hits. So, Victor Fleming said for his costume, I want grandeur gone to seed. This guy had been a dandy. He'd been quite the fellow back in his heyday, but now it's later. He's a little long in the tooth. His bloom has faded, and he's on tough times. So I want his costume to reflect that. Elegant, now faded. So the wardrobe people went all over Los Angeles and got all the kinds of um, secondhand clothes store, thrift store, jackets, and got racks of them, brought them back to the studio. And Victor Fleming, the director, went through them with a fine tooth comb for days. He finally kept coming to one jacket that was just the look he wanted. It was called a Prince Albert Swallowtail. It was very elegant. It was made of black broadcloth, a wide velvet lapel, and uh, it was faded. The broadcloth was a little green, the lapel's a little frayed. It was just the look he wanted. So he called him Frank Morgan, the actor, who played Professor Marvel and also, incidentally, played the wizard and about four other roles in the movie. Frank Morgan came in, tried on the jacket. It fit perfectly. That's it. That's the one they used. That's the one you see in the movie. Here's the clincher. One day... <laughs> oh, one day during shooting, um, <clears throat> the lights were hot in the studio and Frank Morgan was sweating and he reached in the pocket of the jacket to get a handkerchief to dab his forehead. And when he did, he noticed he'd pulled the lining of the, of the jacket, of the pocket out and sewn onto the pocket lining of the jacket was the name, the name, tag, the name tag of the original owner of the jacket, L. Frank Baum. <laughs> the man who wrote The Wizard of Oz. Happened to be his jacket. Holy mackerel. <laughs> Hooray for Hollywood. Those stories light me up. I can see the light. Whoa.